Hi there and welcome to your next lecture for uh, A348 Survey of Chinese Art. Today we are going to look at, at developments in painting in China during the Six Dynasties period. There are a couple of things to consider. One is the uh, emergence of new traditions of figural representation that are going to be first seen in tomb art, but then also we'll start to see in early surviving examples of uh, hand scrolls painted on silk. We're also going to see new developments in the kinds of culture heroes and the kinds of ideas that are celebrated in <clears throat> pictorial art that will be tied to developments that I was talking about last time when we were looking at calligraphy, the emergence of the idea of the scholar, uh, the recluse scholar poet who is an individual kind of free to express himself, a new trend in the history of, of uh, Chinese culture. And so these are important developments both um, in and of themselves, and then for they lay the foundation for the development of pictorial arts in the Tang Dynasty, which will be the subject of our next lecture. Okay, so here I'm showing you, basically this is a rubbing, a transfer rubbing from the wall of a tomb. The tomb itself had this picture basically done in stamped brick. So the, the um, stamped brick had these raised lines that created the image. This is a rubbing, a transfer rubbing, papers put on there and then rubbed onto the wall with um, charcoal so that the, the lines of the, um, the mural can be seen more easily. There, what you have is a subject that becomes popular in about the fourth century, right around the same time that, remember, Wang Cixi and Wang uh, Xianxi are becoming heroes of calligraphy and as individualists. These, uh, the subject here are, let's see, the so-called seven sages of the bamboo grove, that is seven poet scholar officials who lived during a time of great upheaval after the end of the Han Dynasty in the beginning of the Six Dynasties period. They all lived in the second and third centuries of the Common Era, and apart from the one guy there on the top left. I mean, if you can do math, you can see there's eight sages represented here, although only of them are the seven sages from the third century uh, of the Common Era. Uh, not the, sorry, not the second and third, only the third century of the Common Era. Um, a bunch of contemporaries who lived during this time of great political upheaval and all ended up renouncing their official posts and going off into the countryside to basically play music, have intelligent conversations, and get drunk and whistle and enjoy life. Uh, Rong Chi Chi, the first, um, the first guy there is actually from the 5th century BCE, so a much earlier example of this kind of character who, in an earlier turbulent time, did the same thing. He just said, to hell with official life, I'm going to go off and live in the country, and I'm going to go play music and hang out, you know, under a ginkgo tree. This is a new subject in art that appears really in the, the 4th century about a century after the seven sages actually lived, by which point they have become, you might think of them as culture heroes, you know? The way that these mid-fourth century calligraphers who were such individualists became uh, models for all calligraphers and became, you know, massively important to the history of calligraphy because of their individualist styles, these earlier seven sages, because of the way they handled political upheaval and kind of retreated into this noble, you know, uh, hermeticism, uh, <clears throat> are also, it's a new subject in art, and it's a new subject that kind of goes along with developments, naturalistic developments in figural representation and in landscape representation. If you think back to Dunhuang and the murals that we looked at, where you have really like those in the Deer Jataka, you remember you have those kind of diagonally placed mountains that sort of separate one scene from another. Here you're getting a more integrated landscape where you have figures sitting on the ground in naturalistic postures. They are framed and separated by trees, but you get a little bit of a better sense of bodies turning in space maybe than you would in some of those uh, Dunhuang murals uh, or it, which are in a different part of China, even though they might be contemporaneous with this, different part of China, so different stuff going on uh, and a different subject matter. Or if you think of earlier in the Han Dynasty, remember the Wuliang Shrine 
and those very kind of blocky side postures that you can see. There's no sort of indication of the idea of turning in space. Really, those earlier um, shrine pictures from Wu Liang Shrine are meant to convey visual information, and so they, they um, are not naturalistic and they're not meant to be illusionistic, which is very hard to do in the kind of medium that they're working with. Here you've got linear, really line is the main component of the of these compositions and it becomes much easier then to make a more fluid and malleable image. So there's two important things going on here. The subject matter of the seven sages and Rong Chi Chi and the approach to the representation of the figure. So let's take a, a closer look. Here's another set of rubbings, and I've got also a link to a zoomable version of this so you can really see in great detail the different characters and how they're represented here, but this is a better kind of reproduction that you can get a sense of what's going on. Okay, so this, uh, <clears throat> this is this kind of meat, or this is the, the two registers of the wall there across the top, you have Rong Chi Chi playing the chin, this sort of um, musical instrument, backwards, okay? And then you have Rian Xian playing a lute, and that's the second scene there, sitting cross-legged, playing a lute under a tree, enjoying himself. Then you have Liu Ling, who is drinking. He was famous for being a copious drinker of wine, and he wrote actually a famous poem praising the virtues of wine and wine drinking. So here, again, sort of like the um, Orchid Pavilion preface where you start to get the celebration of freedom and individualism and just hanging out, writing poetry, drinking, and kind of, you know, just chilling out and relaxing. Um, that is a new subject, one that we're seeing here in the Seven Sages. And the style, I think, where you have this very beautifully linear um, style and lots of kind of the relaxed postures, bodies turning in space, three-quarter views offered here and there, uh, really corresponds to the subject matter as well. And is very different from the rigid postures that are in, dictated by Confucian protocol. All of these guys would have been Confucian scholars, and when they were at court, they would have been behaving in the proper Confucian manner. And one of Confucius's big points was bodily control the way one moved, the way one walked, everything had to be very controlled and stylized as part of showing respect. And this, of course, is the polar opposite of that. When you're off by yourself in the country, you can kind of let your robe drop open, you can get drunk, you can slobber on yourself, you can let go of all of the strict rigidity of the Confucian code. Okay, so there's three of the guys across the top. The fourth guy on the top is um, sleeping. You don't have to remember their names. I just wanted to give you a sense of like what they're doing in these that is being celebrated and is thought to be, in the case of this southern tomb, appropriate subject matter for the walls of the tomb. Here, maybe what they're thinking is, hey, when I die, this is the kind of place I'm going to go to. Okay, across the bottom row, you have another guy playing the, the, the chin backwards. Uh, Ran Ji, the second guy on the bottom there, the second from the left, is whistling. He was famous as a whistler and a drinker. And whistling is another one of these motifs that will actually keep appearing in Chinese paintings over time. You know, scholars walking around chanting poems, scholars kind of sitting in the woods whistling and enjoying the sound of whistling, all these very relaxing, individualist, eccentric kinds of activities. Uh, there, the third from the left is also drinking wine, Chantao drinking wine, and then Wang Rong, the last one there on the right, is just kind of chilling out and um, balancing, balancing a pipe, just kind of playing around, you know, hanging out, enjoying himself by himself, uh, and balancing a pipe, just a meaningless activity that he's just doing for the heck of it. Another thing to notice here is that the this is naturalistic not only in the body postures and relaxed composure of the different individuals who are each very carefully characterized so that each one looks like an individual. They're not just a sort of stock set of figures who are being replicated here. But also notice that the different kinds of trees, willow trees, ginkgo trees, pine trees, are all recognizable and carefully observed and delineated and the although you've got a tree separating each one of these guys like they're all on their own stage set you also have at the same time 
the illusion of, or the attempt, uh, the um, impression of them sitting in three-dimensional space. So we're starting to get a kind of important beginning of a trend where landscape is a setting for human activity and where landscapes are being carefully observed. The natural world is being carefully observed and recorded. This is a detail of those last two figures I was showing you so you can see a little bit better how they're very individual, very lively, sitting in a variety of relaxed postures, uh, and that's the guy drinking wine and the guy balancing the pipe on his hand, and then also you can see how the um, image does have this kind of sense of depth or three-dimensionality. And here I just brought in, this is a couple of the scenes from the Wuliang Shrine, Sha Emperors on the left and the Virtuous Aunt of Lu on the right, just to remind you of how different this is the late Han, 151 AD here, so a couple of hundred years earlier, and now you recognize that it's a different style of carving, you know, um, not the stamped brick, but uh, carved into a hard stone, but still a different approach to pictorial representation. It makes sense because, remember, the predominant influence in the Wuliang Shrine is really this Confucian emphasis on social order, filial piety, and <clears throat> excuse me, the 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 um, Han cosmology, right? Uh, but then later on, you get this kind of more secular, less um, less Confucian, less rigid. In fact, really a reaction against the kind of protocol of Confucianism of the seven sages of the bamboo growth. And there's a nice comparison there. So two of the Sha emperors on the left, and then you can see how. They're not inhabiting any kind of pictorial space. There's no landscape there. There's no depth or illusion. And that's something that is quite different in the Seven Sages. I realize Seven Sages, in this case, in this tomb relief, is not, there, is not actually a painting. But scholars believe that the models for these tomb bricks or these images would have been hand scrolls that are portable, that are lightweight, so that probably the way that this imagery was transmitting around the uh, country is through portable hand scrolls. And so when people were like, hey, I want a picture of the seven sages of the bamboo grove, the artist could say, oh, well, I happen to have this in my catalog, and here, I'll show you. And then they could, you know, do the transfer uh, it to stamped brick from the, the linear image painted in a, a hand scroll. Here I'm just showing you that this is Rong Chi Chi under a ginkgo tree. This is the um, 5th century BCE, the first guy that you see in the two layers of rubbings. And I just show you this. This is what the actual bricks look like. So you can see that it's not as legible this way, which is why we usually look at the transfer rubbings to try to figure out uh, what we're looking at and what we're seeing. Another example of funerary art from the Six Dynasties period, which tells us a little bit about the development of landscape painting, uh, it's a quite different subject matter, one that's probably a little bit more familiar, but the, the key here is going to be the depiction of the landscape and the incorporation of the landscape into a unified whole, which will be an important development in the Tang and on into the Sung Dynasty. Starting here, this is where we have our early evidence of it, is in this kind of two-dimensional art, in tomb art. These are the two sides of a sarcophagus. They're flipped from one another. You have to imagine that this is a box that was slightly bigger at one end than the other in order to accommodate the head <clears throat> and shoulders of the deceased person. All right. So it's a sarcophagus. And again, I have a zoomable view of this linkable from, or linked from Blackboard so you can see all the details in, you know, zoom up in great detail and kind of take a look at it. I, I'm just showing you here a kind of overview so you can get a sense of the overall layout of the coffin. Okay, so each scene is separated by the landscape, and what we've got here are basically several scenes of paragons of filial piety. And here again, I just want you to think back to the Wuliang Shrine and remember how those scenes of filial piety are really in these shallow stage settings and just separated basically into narrative bands and registers. Here you've got them 
incorporated into a continuous landscape. And in fact, sometimes you get the same person appearing more than once in different stages as the story unfolds across the landscape. But here what you've got that's important for us stylistically is the development of this idea of a unified landscape background. Here's a close-up of one of the scenes. I'm sorry, this isn't a better slide, but this is actually a story of um, a filial son named Yuan Gu. Yuan Gu is ordered by his father to take his grandfather on a litter up to the mountains and leave him there to die. Uh, Yuan Gu's father says, it's time for Grandpa to go. Grandpa's getting old, and um, it's time for him you know, to retire to the immortals. And so Yuangu says, yes, father, whatever you say, I'm a filial son, I do what you want. And so he takes his grandfather up on the litter, drops him off on the mountain, and then he comes back down, and he <clears throat> stashes the litter in front of his dad. He's carrying the litter with him, and uh, the dad says to him, what do you have that for? You don't need that. You know, grandpa's up there on the mountain. And Yuangu says, well, you know, in a few years, you're going to be getting old, so I'm going to need this to take you up there, too. And... Uh, that's when his father realizes what he has done. Yuangu can't confront him directly because that's not filial, but his father also has not behaved filially towards his own father. And so Yuangu, in this kind of not so subtle way, is able to tell his father, hey, you know, um, this is not the right way to behave. And so his father says, oh, what have I done? Let's go bring grandpa da back down from the mountain. And you can see just barely here, the figure of Yuan Gu, the, uh, there in the center, next to the two skinny trees, to the right of the two skinny trees, and uh, Yuan Gu dropping off his grandpa again there towards the right. You can see his grandpa uh, sitting in this niche, and um, there's Yuan Gu um, getting ready to carry the litter back and uh, talk to his dad. All of this happening, even though some people are repeated in various places, all of this happening within a coherently articulated landscape. Here's a slightly better view. This is a rubbing. So you can see there um, <clears throat> Yuan Gu's, um, it, it, well, it's hard to see, I guess, even in this slide. But you can just make it out here, the little cart that he's carrying his grandpa on leaving his grandpa, and uh, uh, then, well, reading from right to left, and uh, then the scene where he's telling his father, well, I'm going to need this for you someday, is off to the left here. And again, although this is not the most convincing, you know, depiction of depth, and you have some parts of the scene which are viewed from overhead, and some parts of the scene which are viewed straight on, the use of a kind of multiple multiple perspective here, and then you also have this kind of patterned wispy cloud background going on. Uh, there is an attempt to make not just framing devices, but a whole coherent landscape across which a story can unfold. Okay, so let's see. This is another scene of filial piety where um, Kai Shun is a filial son. His mother dies, his uh, father remarries, his stepmother doesn't like him very much and so keeps trying to kill him. Um, even though that is happening, Kai Shun is such a filial son, he stays with his dad and his stepmother. When uh, he discovers that his stepmother, or he discovers at one point that the coffin in which his mother is contained is inside a burning building, he goes to rescue her coffin, and that's what you can see there, two different scenes right next to each other, although they're in one, what looks like one landscape. So there on the left is the, um, the house on fire. There uh, towards the right is Kai Shun running in to grab his mother's coffin, uh, risking his life to preserve her as would any good filial son. So here another paragon of filial piety. And again, this is, you know, subject matter we've seen before. It's just a or, or typical sort of filial piety subject matter. It's just that now we've got it in a coherent landscape shape or background rather than in individual registers. Another story uh, from the, the sarcophagus is the story of the uh, virtuous widow of Liang. And the virtuous widow of Liang was a very beautiful woman. And the minute her husband died, the emperor and tons of court officials all were obsessed with her beauty. And so they all start coming to call. 
Her husband's barely cold. He's barely in the ground. She hasn't had a chance to mourn. She hasn't had enough opportunity to, and she hasn't had the proper time frame in order to mourn him. And she knows that with the emperor, she wouldn't be able to say no, right? I mean, this is just not her, uh, not her prerogative. So there, the emperor is coming towards her. There is a crowd of admirers all kind of ready to come and, you know, try to, to, to see her and make a proposal to her. She appears in two places. There she is outside the hut saying, you know, no, no, I, won't, I, I, I must go inside, trying to dodge the question of whether or not she should get married to the emperor. And there inside you can see her sitting on the ground looking at a mirror. She's literally going to cut off her nose to spite her face. Because if she cuts off her nose, she will be ugly. She will be mutilated, and the emperor will no longer want to pursue her. So sacrificing herself for the sake of filial piety so that she will not be forced to marry again and disrespect her husband. Okay, well, and that, again, was a scene where, I mean, it's from the filial, or from the sarcophagus of Nelson Atkins, and that also just gives you a sense of the not just the subject matter, but then the use of this kind of continuous narrative composition and having it all on scroll and a coherent landscape. Another example we have that is now in Japan at a temple called the Shosoin Temple. This is a biwa, a lute that um, is from, it's a little bit late, it's I think 8th century, so it's a little bit later on, but it is an early example, surviving example, of figures in a landscape. A secular <laughs> subject in this case, nothing to do with um, filial piety and nothing to do with the seven sages of the bamboo grove. It's just a picture of a traveler on horseback uh, in mountains. And I'm showing you the full, uh, the full view of the biwa here, the lute. There's just that leather strip in the middle, which is essentially a guard against fingers plucking on the strings to protect the wood of the lute. Uh, but then here it's been decorated with a landscape painting. So there is a close-up of the landscape painting, as you can see. It is um, depicting a couple of travelers on horseback going through a mountain pass. And it is a early, uh, one of the earliest surviving examples we have of what painting on silk must have looked like, what landscape painting on silk must have looked like during this time. You have a combination of perspectives on the far distant mountains and the close-up cliffs here, and then you have this kind of uh, blank area that is suggestive of space into which these travelers have been inserted. And I think you can probably see how this color shaded version would translate into the kind of crowded land composition, landscape composition that we saw with the Nelson Atkins sarcophagus. And we'll look at this again when we start talking about the Tang and the Sung and the further developments in landscape painting on a monumental scale. I just wanted to show you this is some of the early evidence we have that this is a trend that is developing in Chinese painting is this trend towards the depiction of a coherent landscape like we would think of a landscape painting. And then finally, we have one thing, to, one more thing to look at. The first really famous surviving hand scroll uh, of late six dynasties of this famous painter Gu Gaizhi, one of the earliest remaining examples of six dynasties painting that we have. It is probably a later copy, like a ninth century copy of an original which has been lost. But I mean, it's as close as we're going to get to the original. Gu Gaizhi is most famous for the scroll that we're going to look at in detail, this scroll called The Admonitions of the Palace Instructress. This was a text from the third century. It was a poem from the 200s. It was about proper behavior for women in the court. Okay, It's an old poem. It is, by the time Gugaijer comes along, is a classic, you know, it's a couple hundred years old by the time he comes along, and uh, it was a classic, and so he is attached to the court as a court painter, and he gets a commission, apparently, to, to create a illustrated version of this poem. He is sometimes called the father of Chinese painting because not only is he one of the first for whom we have an actual hand scroll on silk that we can look at to kind of get a sense of his style, but because he was credited with really breathing life into 
the figures that he painted. This was a new thing that people were seeing in art. Uh, I think I told you when we were looking at Dunhuang, the story of Vimalakirti, the lay person, the Taoist lay person who says to uh, a bodhisattva, Manju Shri, hey, listen, I know as much about Buddhism as you do, and then they get in this debate, and Fima Lakirti wins the debate, and uh, so he's a sort of Chinese culture hero for being um, able to, you know, debate in a uh, scholarly fashion with a Buddhist expert. Uh, Gukai Jur actually painted a Vima Lakirti that was on a temple wall, and the story goes that it was like magic. When he finally finished the painting, the last detail that he painted in was the eyes of Vima Lakirti, and it just seemed to infuse life into his Vima Lakirti. And it made him famous. It is what brought him to the uh, court in the late six dynasties and got him these commissions that he got. When people looked at his work, what they praise in his work is that ability to make his figures look alive and for what later writers called his gossamer style, his linear style, the way that he depicts the figures is very elegant, elongated, airy, very, very delicate, just hair-like thin lines that outline the figures. And yet at the same time, although they're very linear uh, in the, the way that they're composed, they have a liveliness and a um, convincingness to them and they look like they're turning in space. Uh, so he is really credited with being a major innovator when it came to pictorial arts in China. And even you know during his lifetime and immediately after, quite celebrated. The Gukai Chur's um, admonitions of the palace instructors exists in a couple of copies. We're mostly going to look at the copy that is housed now at the British Museum in London. And what I'm showing you here is just an overall view of the admonition scroll with the later editions of colophons and texts, etc., etc., at the end. We know that over time, sections of this scroll were cut out. The admonitions copy in... Uh, London is missing three key scenes that we know are part of the poem and are part of other copies of Gugacher's original work. So we don't know what happened to them or where they've gotten off to. Uh, it's just to emphasize that these things have a biography as well as an original creation point. Also, I just wanted to show you how big this thing is. As you'll be reading this week, there is a particular way in which hand scrolls and hanging scrolls are viewed and they are really episodic. You have you start out with the entire thing rolled up so from from right to le or excuse me from left to right and you unscroll it from uh, starting with the and when you open it you first see the stuff that's on the very right of the screen and you kind of roll up the excess off the off the right as you're unrolling to the left and you stop with oh, about a distance of, you know, however far apart you can hold your hands, and you stop and you look at individual sections of the scroll at a time. So these were never meant to be unrolled all the way and just looked at all the time. They're meant to be viewed by an individual in a kind of private setting, uh, slowly controlling the pace, unfolding like a comic strip or like a movie at your own leisure. I have a zoomable view of the admonition scroll linked uh, it's from the site, the British Museum site, and I just want you to go and t kind of peruse it, take a look at it, because it'll give you a sense of how big the thing is and how long it is and how much there is to scroll through. Anyway, so this is the entire admonition scroll, and then I want to look at some of the scenes from the admonition scroll so we can get a sense of what it is that Gugajur is famous for. Well, this is a copy of the, of the scroll that is housed now in uh, Beijing. So it's a different scene that uh, the, <clears throat> excuse me, a different scene, uh, or a different um, version of the same, a different copy of the same scene. I don't know, I had a little senior moment there. Uh, 